Please welcome the founder and co-CEO of Innismore, Sharon Pashrisha, in discussion with Skift founder and CEO, Rafik Ali. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Thank you, Sharon, for being here. The best interview is yet here. Don't go to the drinks yet. It's only another 20 oh, minutes left. Come back. Oh, my God. And this also truly is the graveyard shift. I what? mean, this, this is the graveyard shift. Well, um, <laughs> I really wanted you to close because I, I have I hyped you as the hottest hotelier <laughs> in the did. world today. You also and gave so, me the graveyard shift to graveyard do that. Graveyard shift. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll do a better job uh, next time. I mean, you, it's always a pleasure. You to know be where to find me. Always a pleasure. Um, to be so, here. Sharon, for those of you who don't know, runs Ennismore. So, Ennismore is a company that maybe a lot of people who are not in the hotel industry do not know, but Ennismore uh, runs the Hoxton brand, a bunch of others. So, and they have a tie up. Accor is, the, is a large shareholder now. And so, uh, a lot of the, uh, all of the Accor's lifestyle brands have rolled under Sharon. And um, beyond that, he is also um, just took, is, has an option to, from, from Saudi to, to open up a lot of new hotels in Saudi. Qatar, uh, the deal with Qatar, which was, I guess, not announced yet, is about to close. It's announced. We haven't closed yet. But we haven't closed, announced. but they're buying an 11, a 10, 10, 11 percent stake uh, from Accor to own uh, part of your company as well. And you're opening lots of hotels. You, you're telling me you're opening 18 hotels uh, before the end of the year. Right? Uh, correct. I mean, I, you packed in quite a lot into quite that. Quite a lot. Intro. My, the, but, the point that I was trying to make was you were you opened ten or dozen hotels in ten years, and now you're opening hundreds of hotels. Yeah. So, so I guess my, my journey's been kind of starting as an entrepreneur, my first hotel, virtually moving into that hotel, learning every part of it, and then slowly expanding it. Uh, and it took ten years for us to get to I think 13, 14 hotels. Um, and then we started figuring out the asset light side of the business probably four or five years ago and started signing some asset light deals. Up to that point, we had owned and operated all of our, our own assets. And I guess this, this latter part of my journey with, with ACO has been about them putting together all of their lifestyle brands. And they've been on this journey for lifestyle for a number of years. And I think we both realized um, that there was, there was a real opportunity to do lifestyle at scale. I think what I found quite interesting is if you're I'm a super lifestyle group, I think we wrote in one of the articles. Yeah, I, I quite like that word, right. super lifestyle group. Um, I, I think what's interesting is you either are a small, creatively minded, authentic operator, but then you sort of tap out at eight, 10, 12 hotels. And it's bloody hard because I've been on that journey. Or you're part of a larger mother group, um, but then you get lost in the, in the system. And I guess what we're trying to do at Ennismore is, is sort of buck the trend. Um, where you know, we've got five what we call home bases, um, though myself and Gaurav, my co-CEO, are based in London, um, and we're really autonomous in, in how we operate. We've got an independent culture. Our brands are very much linked to the people that are very much there. We've got a lot of our founders from the original brands are very much involved, so whether it's Jeremy from Mama Shelter, Christoph Hoffman from 25 Hours. So what we've really knit together um, is a truly unique global lifestyle platform. Uh, we have 100 operating hotels across 14 of our brands. And last I checked, 160, 170 in the pipeline. So to do lifestyle at scale hasn't quite been done before. Um, not in a way that's but truly... Do you find that an oxymoron? Yeah, I think it is, Rafael. I think it is. I think there's, there's actually a tension between authenticity and scale. And and if we didn't have the founders involved in the brands, and if I wasn't kind of the founder-led driving the product side of the business, I'd say it'll be challenging because you know, lifestyle brands are hard to do. They're really hard to do. Um, you intensive, think about it. high touch. Super intensive. There isn't really a playbook like you have with traditional hotels where you say, off you go, I'm just going to build this, just replicate this. 40, 50% of our business is restaurants and bars. Those restaurants and bars only work if locals that live and work in the area frequent those restaurants and bars. Mm -hmm. And that's bloody hard to do. To and you've done a very good job with Hoxton, which in London, if any of you have been to London, there's a good chance if you're in a certain set, you would have gone to Hoxton because of the food, even if not to stay, which is what I've done. Yeah, I think, if, so, this, so the way we set the business up is I've got four studios that report straight into me. So it's obviously it's a fairly large business now. 
um, that's, that's, that's global. But the four studios, the first is, is an, our F&B studio called Carte Blanche. We have a lot of owners that come to us and say, okay, well, if F&B is 40%, 50% of our business, how are you really going to create concepts for us that compete against high street restaurants? And these are F&B that you own and operate versus outsourcing? Absolutely. So we own and operate. So we have about 40 brands that we've incubated in-house. And I don't mean incubated in-house as in we've been the secret source behind every brand. This is about finding incredible local chef partners, finding incredible local operators that we've aligned with. So it's really a combination of credibility across all the markets we're in. And that's an amazing team of mixologists, creatives, operators um, that have come together to ultimately create this, this, this really talented group of people. We then have our design studio. So for 10 years, we've designed our own, our own, um, our, our own hotels. And of course, that's hard to do at scale. But I think if you've got a strong design ethos as a business, it allows you to really deliver exceptional products. We've got graphic designers on staff, interior designers on staff, and design directors that support a lot of our new brands. And I think that's really, really important because, again, in the asset light business, when you're opening, as we are, 50, 60 hotels a year, the, the truth really is in our ability to sit across owners and across external interior designers and be able to deliver products that are authentic, products that last, that kind of stand the test of time. So that's quite challenging, ultimately, to do. The third studio for me is, is technology. So five years ago, we started our journey um, really not choosing the traditional kind of hotel route, which is using a third-party booking engine um, uh, or a white-label booking engine. So we decided to foolishly hire our first software engineer, our first product you know, individual. And you know, one thing turned into the next, and we really built our own booking engine that, that, that allowed us to API directly into the PMS. Five years later, 50% of our business comes direct at thehoxland.com. We have looked to book conversion rates of 10%, really industry-leading numbers, which now all of a sudden we're going to replicate across all of our 14 brands. So that's a team of 30 of software engineers, product engin engineers, uh, data scientists that really drive our own brand.com. Because I think if you're, if you're building an ecosystem of lifestyle brands, your brand.com is your most powerful channel. And, and that's, been, that's been an interesting kind of journey. And so... Um, and then, sorry, just to finish the fourth, because yeah. I know I said four. The last one is sponsorships. We, have, we, we find we have a lot of brands that approach um, our hotel individually to say, hey, we would love to do a partnership, you know, if it's Chase Bank or it's Theragun or it's you know, an alcohol brand. Um, so we kind of consolidated all those efforts under a global sponsorship and partnerships team that's based out of, out of New York that basically works with some of the most amazing and incredible brands to activate across all of our hotels. Interesting. So, uh, so is that becoming a bigger part of the business? It's great. It's they amazing. They pay you to yeah. to to act to have your captive audience, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, they they love the brands. They connect with them. They they love our customers and our guests, and they love they want us to be able to curate experiences across our physical locations and across digital locations. It's a, it's it's a profit center for us. It's not a cost center. Actually, all four of these areas of, of our, our, our profit, our profit centers. centers. Yeah. So in terms of, and you're an entrepreneur yourself, obviously you, you started Ennismore. Um, you, you are now in charge of these owner entrepreneurs that were there, 21C, Mama Shelter, et cetera, et cetera. What do you lose, what do you miss in terms of um, the, you used to be able to go to every opening, now you yeah, can't. Yeah, that's a good question. Physically you can't. Yeah, I guess the transition for me personally as an entrepreneur has been kind of knowing everything about everything. I guess you could, you know, could draw parallels in your own business where you, you, you're sort of in the trenches on every email, have to know, want to see, and that's just not possible now. So, you know, I've just surrounded myself with people that are, frankly, way smarter than and I am. And how you and Gaurav um, split your responsibilities? Yeah, so, so Gaurav, uh, so, you know, Gaurav and I went to the same boarding school together in India. He's been in ACO for 20 years. He's done all of uh, M&A for, for, for Sebastian, for, for Accor, for the last, last 10 years. Um, he focuses his time and his efforts on driving performance across the assets, reporting up to Accor, T plus five, legal, commercial, and really running the day-to-day -day operation of the business. And, and I focus on everything the guest touches and sees. So product, um, things that I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm probably passionate about. So, Everything our guests touch from our brand.coms to our physical environments to our brand partnerships, our F&B partnerships, our design, um, and anything between. Of course, being co-CEOs, you kind of make a lot of the big decisions jointly and together. Right. 
um, but at this pace, you know, we're growing at 30 plus percent CAGR year on year. You, you kind of need to divide and rule. And so we talked about, and I know Hoxton has a co-working just because we, we have worked in the, the, the Hoxton co-working space. Um, so how are you thinking, and Accor is probably the, the biggest hotel brand that is very bullish on co-working. I think the other hotel brands haven't jumped into it as much. Yep. Uh, but you obviously jumped independently from Accor uh, in that as well. So what are you seeing in your hotels? What's the, what's the opportunity in core? What's the state of your co-working business today? And what's the opportunity you see? Sure, sure. So I think for, for the Hoxton, when I, when I first started it, you know, our public areas, our lobbies, those of you been at any of our hotels, have really been a reflection of the neighborhood. And people would love to come and hang out, use the super fast Wi-Fi, hang out, have a cup of coffee, and kind of laptop. And this is, you know, it's been going for 10 years. So we've sort of been, in the co-working business for 10 years. We just didn't charge anyone for it. Right. And, I've, and I've always thought about, well, what, what's the kind of, what's the next layer up if, you know, you're just a kind of laptop or kind of cruising in our public spaces, what's the next level up? So we had the opportunity in London, um, mainly because I was nervous to go above 200 keys in one of our locations in the Southwark, uh, to build 850 desks across, across seven floors. And really the model there was, how do you take the, we'll call them laptop warriors, on our ground floor and kind of take them up into this dedicated space. We did a bunch of research and worked out that actually people quite enjoyed the co-working space, but the thing they valued most was, was two things, flexibility and transparency. They wanted flexibility and they wanted to know that if they're signing up to something that's... Oh, we're showing a video. Look at that. Space. If they're signing up to something that's 200 pounds a month, it really is 200 pounds a month and you're not going to tide them over with extra charges along the way. So we started this business, and, and it's just been a boomerang success for us because not only did eight, all 850 desks get sold in Southwark, we've got a waiting list of 400 people wanting to join, but we launched in Chicago, and that's, that's, that's sold out and, 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 and been incredibly successful. What was interesting, I remember sitting with the team, I'm like, listen, guys, we're at 100% occupancy. The team were like, okay, now we need to lock in everyone and, and, and get them to sign longer-term contracts. And that's like, the opposite of what we set this business up for. He's like, no, no, it's great, we'll just lock them in, lock the revenue in. So I said, okay, well, let's, 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 let's understand these 850 people that are occupying our desks, and let's understand, on average, what is their average length of stay. Because if, if they valued, you know, if they, if they wanted to generally move in and move out, you'd find a lot more churn. Mm -hmm. We found that average length of stay was nine months. So basically what it told us is they valued the flexibility, but they didn't necessarily exercise it when they needed when they needed. So for us, having that flexibility and being super transparent in terms of how we're pricing it has kind of worked for us. So now we're taking the working from brand, which has historically been linked to the Hoxton, and we're going to take it across all of our 14 brands. So you may find a working from SLS, working from Mondrian, and what this brand will then do is more. These are all brands that you own now. That's correct. So they're all part of it. It's more, and I, and I think the, the the working from brand will morph into the design ethos of that mother brand. And are the are the margins there, co-working compared to the other? Yeah, parts of the I mean it's 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 kind of I mean you know rule of thumb it's 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 a third up cost, a third rent, and a third profit if you if you sort of do your jobs well. Um, you, you know if you, again if you if your if your product is strong, you should see a 20, 30, 40 percent margin uplift on traditional what we call category A office in 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 in, in the UK. So I think there's there's the, the commercials are ultimately there. What's interesting is. What's going through my mind is should I have built whatever hundred rooms in that space instead of the co-working in hindsight. That's that's something I often think about that. But what's amazing is owners love the diversification of revenue stream, right? So if you think of a, a hotel like ours in Southwark, you've got 40% revenue, which is rooms, 30% which is F and B, and then another 30%, if my math is correct, on on on, on co-working. So you actually you've got a really well diversified revenue base. You've got businesses, you've got restaurants and bars linked to locals, and you've got a traditional, traditional-ish hotel product. And and what we're finding is owners and investors just love that diversification of revenue stream. Can we put up the poll? I guess we forgot to put the room in there, but just um, put up the poll up there if you can. Um, what do you feel is the most compelling facet of lifestyle hotels? I guess we forgot cool. to ask Zion the room itself. Yeah, because uh, I guess room would be the most important part. Um, but, uh, I, I, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, I think 
design. So I guess design, yeah. which is what your, your thesis has always been very design forward. I think so. I think so. And design means so many things to so many people. people. Right. I think I think it's it's I think one of the things missing for me there is, is around culture because I think at some level anyone can hire a fancy designer and maybe even a tattooed bartender. That doesn't really make a lifestyle hotel, frankly. I think I think lifestyle is is a lot deeper than that. I think you've got a I think you got to, your brand needs to first and foremost stand for something. You have to have a purpose. Like somebody asked me the other day, would we buy more hotel brands? I mean, maybe, but my you job. Buy Soho House. I, oh. heard, I heard they're about to make a profit finally after 26 years. Yeah, and 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 good on them. Good, good, good on them. Nick's a good, Nick's Sorry. a good buddy Nick of mine. Gonna gonna, I'm not going to fall into that trap, Rafa. Nick's a good buddy of mine. Uh, so, I, so I think it, I think around culture is is incredibly important. I think you need a lot more, a lot more than just just design. And so. Um, has the, uh, we, we talked with Vasu about the blended trip and the types of people that are staying now and the, and the mixture of business and leisure, and it's hard now to tell. Are you seeing that? I mean, it would seem that you would be riding on that curve where people want a lifestyle, even if they're tra a, a lifestyle hotel, even if they're traveling on a business trip. Are you seeing any of that evidence in terms of blended trips in your business, or can you tell? Yeah, I think I well, think I guess what, the co-working sort of speaks to that as co well. Co-working speaks to it. I think what we're seeing is a few things, right? So now we have the access to kind of wider data and including ACO data. What we're seeing is lifestyle hotels are recovering or have recovered a lot faster post the pandemic, right? So, you know, good 10, 15 points quicker, which is great. Tells you that that naturally consumers are gravitating towards a product that they can connect with, a restaurant and bar that they can they can they, they can ideate with. So I think that's a that's a really kind of important important shift. What was the other part of your question? Um, what was my part of the second question? <laughs> Too late. Yeah. Um, blended trip. I was asking. Blended trip. Saying, that's yes. it. Blended trip. I think we are finding that you know, the, and I think Vasu mentioned that earlier. That the 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 twenty four hour trip is gone, right? I think I don't think people are going doing the red eye in the morning, the 12 hour trip, the red eye in the morning and then kind of back at night or you know, back the following early morning. I think that trip is gone. I think they're blending a skiff conference on a, on a Wednesday, Thursday, staying over in New York for the weekend and then kind of heading back. You know, our business is typically, certainly the urban locations, roughly 50-50 between corporate and the leisure market, roughly. Most of your business is urban, right? No, I think we've got, I mean, huge resorts in, you know, from Mexico City, you know, out of Mexico, Middle East. So we've got huge, huge, huge resort part of our business as well. Um, and is the length of stay, like Sobasi was saying, the length of business travel is, uh, the, of, of, if the day trip is, not, is gone, the length of stay, and Chesky is going to come, the Airbnb CEO, he, he talks a lot about how length of stays has become much, much higher than what used to be pre-pandemic. Are you seeing any changes De there? Definitely seeing that. I mean, I, if I can connect to it, like Glen Eagles, for instance, our length of stay is dramatically increased. And for a resort business or an estate business like that, length of stay is incredible for a hotel group. Right? You, 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 it's way more profitable to have them come from further away, stay for longer. And so certainly in a resort environment, they're, they're, they're doing more. So your trev bar is, is substantially higher. So Art, and this, that. I don't know the question. This is a. Uh, are the, is the booking window for lifestyle hotels shorter historically compared to like chain hotels? Ooh, that's a really but, but good question. Our average is, 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 I think it's definitely shortened for sure. Uh, I, it used to be 30 to 20 to 30 days. It's, it's a lot shorter now. We found that the pace of bookings is 10, 15 days out, whereas previously it would be, it would be 30 days out. So it's definitely narrowed. I couldn't answer that with, against traditional hotels. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, in terms of one of the things that, that I wanted to ask you, so obviously you're opening, um, you, you have this $400 million fund from PIF, from the Saudi. So let me clarify. So, okay. so we, on, on, a, on a recent roadshow in, in, in Saudi Arabia, we signed a agreement with TDF, which is a. Oh, the, TDF, the, not PIF. Okay. Correct, TDF, which, is, which I guess is a subsidiary of, 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 uh, of the state of PIF eventually, it's the, uh, it's the Tourism Development Fund. Yes. And the mandate there is to build lifestyle hotels across the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So it's to use the Ennis Moore brands across the kingdom. Um, and that's the joint venture that we signed. So they, they're, they're going to be raising the capital, building it, deploying it. And we're just going to be managing um, well, probably 12, 15 hotels from that capital pool. 
And this is the, the hotels across your portfolio. Yeah, I think we'll, 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 we'll kind of look at what's right uh, as we go through that process. We're still early days. We still haven't kind of started looking at active opportunities, but for over the next couple of months and years, we'll, we'll look at and that. And so um, talk about, so what, and obviously Dubai is, continues to be a big center. For Dubai's you. great. Uh, it's, it's a key, key market for us. We've got you know, 25 hours we just opened, which is, which is a great product. Uh, just at DIFC, um, the SLS we opened last year, and we've got a handful of projects in the pipeline. So I think Dubai will be our top five destinations, um, of any top five cities actually. Uh, Are you going for the cities. World Cup? I will go for a few games in for Doha. For a few games, yes. Because Accor, your the Accor is managing all the non-hotel accommodations. That is correct. Yes. For the World Cup. That is as well. correct. So I'm guessing you have an in somewhere. There are some benefits to uh, to that. Correct. To be, yes. To be part of Accor. Um, okay. So. Um, so speaking of that, in terms of the, what's the, um, what's the most exciting region in the world for you? You're opening so many hotels in so many different parts of the world. Yeah. What is the most exciting region today for you? So what's interesting is I've, I've obviously been traveling gangbusters since we opened. We, we've got some really exciting projects. We're opening the Mondrian in Hong Kong, the Mondrian in Singapore, which I'm really excited about. Um, the Hoxton in Berlin. Um, shortly. Did you take over the Mondrian in LA, I guess? Is it, is it still there? That's correct, yeah. Okay. That's, we're managing that. Yeah. Correct, yeah, we're managing that. I think the bit that the, 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 the region that excites me only because I think we haven't even scratched the surface and potential is, is the Americas. I think we have an incredible opportunity. The US, you mean? Or the US. US. I think the Americas generally. I think, you know, South America, but, but even North America. I think given that so many of our brands, certainly the erstwhile SBE brands and, and Morgans, you know, we're born here. I think we've got a really interesting opportunity to reboot, you know, these brands that have been so relevant and actually everyone's got a story in these hotels um, to be able to kind of chart its destiny for the next few decades. So, you know, we've got a lot of traction across the Americas. We're, we're doing and opening a lot of hotels. I just don't think we've even scratched the surface. I think it could be, you know, our biggest market um, in, in years to come. And so how many brands do you have now, number-wise? We have 14 brands. 14. Is it 14 too many, or is it... Is it, is it 14 too many? I think... No, I'm not, meaning no, it's 14 it, large number. Look, I think what's important is, is... I think a brand's not a brand. I think a brand is a product if it doesn't have a purpose. So my job really is to make sure that every one of our brands is distinctive. Um, both in terms of design, but in terms of culture and, and value. And that's both to our guests. So you got to walk in and say, this brand stands for this, so it means this. But also for our team and our employees to be able to connect with these brands. Because, you know, I, let's no secret, I think the hotel industry loves to accumulate brands. Right. I, 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 I'm but not, your company is one of them. My, my company is not one of them. We have 14 incredible brands, and I think we have the ability to make sure that every one of them stands unique amongst itself, but also stands distinctive across the competition. Across the competition. I think so. And so, and have you thought of, I mean, obviously a lot of action in the short-term rental world, have you thought of taking your uh, ethos yeah. and applying it to anything other than, than hotels? So I think on the re residential side, you know, what we, what we, we sell a couple of billion dollars worth of real estate. Um, with our, with our flags on it, and, and we're incredibly successful and good at that. Um, arguably, the Americas and parts of Asia are, are better than other parts of the world at it. I think the idea of applying what we do you know, can go anywhere. You know, the idea of creating spaces that have meaning, creating service and a culture that kind of have, has a bit of depth, um, telling stories. I think you can have any sort of canvas. I mean, I'd love to do a festival. Um, I'd love to do you know, take the spirit of what we're doing in, t in terms of physical buildings. Hotels haven't done festivals. Yeah, it's an interesting idea, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, look how incredible Coachella is or look at Burning Man. I mean, you know, there's some amazing spaces that are, you know, very reflective of what we're trying to do as a company. Ultimately, we're looking to tell amazing stories in an environment that's comfortable and safe um, through amazing people. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to, to, to do one of those. So that, that's probably one. Uh, in terms of a brand that you would love to buy, <laughs> name it here. Um, I, I, uh, I, 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 I've of, I, yeah, I admire, I admire Ace. I love what Alex did when he started, you know, Ace, and it's kind of fiercely independent, incredibly authentic narrative, and, and I'm a huge fan of, of, of what, what the folks at Ace do. I know, do. I guess Accor, and you paused a little bit on M&A as you're building up the existing pipeline. Would that be fair to say? 
Yeah, look, our business is growing at 30% a year. Like, I, I, I sort of have enough to do. There's not enough hours in the day. You know, my wife will tell me, that, you know, I, I just need, I need to hang out more with her and the kids. There's literally not enough hours in the day. Like, you know, ultimately, I think M&A is good up to a certain point, but it's also a huge distraction, right? If you're building a brand or a business where culture is important, and I mean culture from employee perspective and team, that's really hard to do when you're, when you're crashing businesses together. It's really, really hard to do. And of course, the original combination of, 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 of Ennismore, you think about all the businesses, right? I mean, there's 25 hours from Germany. There was Joe and Joe that came in from Accor. There's Mama Shelter from Paris, SB from the US. Hoxton from, from London. I mean, it, <laughs> that's not, that's a lot of you know, that's, that's a lot. That really is yeah. not. So I'm really proud of us coming out the other side, having built a team that all subscribe to the same values. And we're really on a winning ticket. I'm really excited about the future. You know, m and I think we'll, we'll look at it opportunistically, but it definitely, it's not a focus for our, for our growth, just purely based on the fact that we're growing so much and so fast already. Last quick one, if I can sure. squeeze in. Um, does, do lifestyle hotels have a easier time with, with labor, with hiring? I think brands that have purpose have an easier, an easier path for recruiting. So I don't think a lifestyle and hotels you, but are But you're alone. still going through all the issues that a lot Yeah, of we, so, we totally are. We totally are. I mean, you know, the, our kitchens, you know, we're always short in the kitchens. We're always short in the front of house. But genuinely speaking, it, it, I think we do a lot better than most because you've got, you know, you're a mission-based company. And I think if you genuinely live by your values, and it means a lot, because at the end of the day, you're nothing without your staff. I mean, everyone's had an amazing, been to an incredible hotel that's fallen right flat because you've had that bad interaction or you've, you've had that bad engagement. For me, it's the most important thing. We're, you know, we live by our people. We have 20,000 and counting people, recruiting thousands every, every other month. That's, that's the secret source that makes us unique. And um, how many hotels do you have in New York now? Uh, we've got four in New York. Which one should yeah. we go to if anybody wants to go to tonight? I'd go to the Hoxton in Williamsburg. Um, I would try and get a reservation to Laser Wolf on the rooftop, which is uh, an incredible restaurant. But unfortunately, I think it's sold out for the next couple of months. But if you can get the opportunity to go to Laser Wolf. Or if you email Sharon, please do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, guys. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.